Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's our great pleasure uh, today that uh, uh, Kumande from uh, University of Queensland uh, would uh, here to present his uh, his results in definite causal orders. Um, so let's welcome him. Okay. Thanks, Nishu, for the introduction. Uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers for giving me an opportunity to present my talk. So title of my talk is Indefinite Causal Order. So this talk is divided into uh, three parts. The, in the first two parts, I'll talk about uh, two of my experiments that I have done in my PhD. And uh, in the next part, I'll talk about the theory work that I have done on uh, quantum causal structures. So indefinite causal order, but what does it mean? So uh, imagine a situation uh, where uh, suppose I wake up and uh, during my breakfast, I want my life to be a bit more exciting. And so I start playing a game. So if I toss a coin, if the result is head, I'll go for the coffee and then I'll go for the sandwich. If the result is tail, then I'll reverse the order. Okay, so in the realm of classical physics, it is only possible to have situation of a fixed order, a fixed order of uh, these two events. But however, quantum mechanics admits a quantum coin where it is possible to have superposition of head and tail. So the question is with that sort of quantum coin, can we have superposition of two different orders? Uh, let me uh, answer you by a device called uh, quantum switch. In a quantum switch, uh, there is one control system and there is one target system. This control system controls order of two operations. So when the control system is zero, the order of operation is B first and then A. And when it is one, then the order is reversed. But when there is superposition of uh, this zero and one, then we will have superposition of two different orders. So this work has got a lot of scientific uh, interest, uh, specifically because it has foundational uh, implication in quantum gravity where uh, su uh, like superposition of two different space times are considered. And for, the pra for pragmatic, it is uh, like important in uh, some tasks like communication, augmentation or computation. So question is, can we realize this sort of indefinite causal order in lab? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, it has been first implemented uh, by Philip Walter's group in Vienna. So in that group, uh, they used uh, path of the photon as control system and uh, polarization of the photon as target. This op uh, operations A and B were represented by a series of wavelets. So when uh, the photon goes through this red path, then it goes through A first and then B, and then it goes to the output. And when the photon goes through the blue path, then uh, the order is reversed. Now, this small dip cube is called beam splitter that creates superposition of two different paths. So with a beam splitter, we'll have a superposition of these two different order. So this is a beautiful experiment. However, uh, there are two interesting philosophical questions associated with this experiment. So first of all, you can see uh, like in two different rounds, photon passes through two different uh, points of the web plates, which means these operations A and B could be, could be in principle uh, spatially distinguished. Also, uh, it is possible to have a scenario when by the time the photon goes through B first and then goes through A, then uh, it is already out of its coherence length. So which means this uh, operation A and B could be temporarily distinguishable as well. So this idea has, is shown in this space-time diagram where uh, like uh, X1 and X2 uh, shows the spatial separations of the operation and this short coherence length uh, uh, results in temporal distinguishability of the operations. So to uh, mitigate these uh, issues, uh, 
uh, in my PhD, I started uh, like uh, working on my own our own quantum switch. So uh, this is these are our experiment team like Michael, Jackie, and Andrew, and we collaborated with our theorist friends Fabio, Christina, and Cyril. So in our quantum switch, uh, we use transfer special mode of light as the target. Specifically, Hermite Gaussian 1-0 mode represents sket 0 and Hermite Gaussian 0-1 mode represents sket 1. And we use polarization of light as control. So horizontally polarized light means sket 0, vertically polarized light means sket 1, and a diagonal polarized light means uh, 0 plus 1. We also need to implement our uh, operations A and B. So we did that by means of a rotating prism and a pair of cylindrical lenses. So a rotating prism uh, acts in such a way that it uh, rotates a special profile of the beam. So for example, if we want to go from zero to zero plus one, rotating a prism would uh, result in that transformation. On the other hand, this cylindrical lens uh, admits a selective phase difference. To be precise, uh, a 90 degree phase shift on ket one, but uh, no phase shift on ket zero. So for example, if we want to go from zero plus one to zero plus I one, then this cylindrical lens pair will uh, make transformation possible. So, okay, we are ready with our ingredients and this is our, this is the circuit diagram of our quantum switch. These uh, two small cubes are uh, polarizing beam splitter. Uh, it works in such a way that horizontally polarized lights transmits through the cube and vertically polarized light gets reflected through this interface. So, and you can also see this operation C here at the output. So in our experiment, it's basically a polar measurement of polarization at the output. So uh, you can see when the photon is uh, horizontally polarized, it goes through B first and then A, and then it goes through the output. However, when the photon is vertically polarized, it goes through A first and then B and uh, to the output and a diagonal polarized photon will admit superposition of uh, two different orders. As you can see in both two rounds, uh, the photon passes through the same axis. So uh, the spatial separation issue is resolved. Uh, to uh, overcome the temporal separation issue, we used a light source with a large coherence length, large enough to cover the entire experiment. And so like, uh, temp uh, those operations could not be temporally distinguished. Okay, we created a uh, setup, but how can we be sure that it is uh, indeed indefinite causal order? To answer that, we used a concept called causal witness. Uh, mathematically, a causal witness is uh, a hyperplane that separates a set of uh, definite ordered uh, process from a set of indefinite ordered process. And when this uh, witness is indefinite, the expectation value of the witness is less than zero, we can um, surely say that this is, an, uh, this is a setup that shows indefinite order. So this uh, uh, idea has been proposed in these two papers and we use this particular tool in our experiment to verify the indefiniteness of uh, the quantum switch. So for that, we use these uh, six unitary operations Identity, uh, this I is identity operation, X, Y, Z are um, Pauli operations. And this Y plus Z and X plus Z are uh, like operation that can be represented by summation of Pauli operations. Uh, so there is there will be one uh, normalization factor of one over root two that is missing. Uh, so like, uh, okay, so these are the intensity profiles of the beam after transformation. And these are the phase profile of the beam after transformation. Okay, so with these unitaries, uh, we measured our witness and theoretically, the witness should be minus 0.248 and experimentally we measured it to be minus 0.171, which is still negative and uh, that shows uh, in our experiment, we managed to achieve 18 standard deviation violation from the uh, definite ordered process. So thus uh, we guarantee our quantum switch to be indefinitely ordered. 
So we reported this work in this uh, paper. And that was my first paper after I joined my PhD. I was particularly happy because it got a lot of uh, media attention. And the most surprising result was uh, when it got selected as 2018 breakthrough of the year. So I ended this experiment with a happy note and I moved on to my next experiment. So in my next experiment, I collaborated with uh, 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 like Andrew and Jackie uh, uh, were my uh, experimental, experimentalist mentors. And uh, we collaborated with uh, our theorist friends from Griffith University, Gerardo and Ia. So this project is about communication through noise. So uh, as it is well known that uh, noise is uh, unavoidable, unavoidable in a communication scenario, and uh, the most detrimental noise can completely uh, scramble information encoded in the quantum state and we will get nothing. So uh, uh, a common uh, noise model uh, could be this depolarizing channel. A depolarizing channel is such that it admits uh, in an input uh, quantum state and uh, the transformation is represented like this, where X, Y, Z are Pauli operators. And this Q denotes strength of this depolarizing channel. So you can see when Q equal to zero, this entire term vanishes and uh, the state remains intact. However, when Q equal to one, then all of these operations uh, act uh, with equal probability, which means we will get a maximally uh, mixed state. That means information is completely, completely scrambled. Okay, so one uh, depolarizing channel is bad. So let's make it worse. Let's use two depolarizing channels. So uh, quite intuitively, when we add these two depolarizing channels in a definite order, uh, we will not get any information out of it. However, surprisingly, if we manage to uh, connect these depolarizing channels in an indefinite order, uh, we will have uh, some non-zero information at the output. So this work uh, was uh, reported by Kiribela in this paper. And uh, this uh, non-zero information is measured in terms of Holevo quantity. That, that is basically capacity of this entire channel. And uh, this is uh, calculated by this Rossi tilde, von Neumann entropy of Rossi tilde, which is basically the output, output control system. And um, H mean is minimum entropy of the whole, like entire output of the quantum switch. So with that, uh, we evaluated our, the whole level quantity of our process and this is the experimental result. This X axis is uh, Q, that is noise of depolarizing channel. And this Y axis is logarithm of the whole level quantity. You can see at uh, full noise, uh, that is Q equal to one, this definite ordered scenario is going straight to minus infinity, that is the whole level quantity is zero. And uh, this uh, black line shows even at uh, full depolarizing strength, uh, it is possible to have non-zero information that uh, specifically the, okay, so this red dots are our experimentally measured data. So these red dots are our experimentally measured data and this orange shade is uh, um, uh, due to, uh, orange shade is due to imperfect visibility. So at full depolarizing strength, uh, it is possible to have 4.448 percentage of um, bits possible to trans. It is possible to transmit 4.48 percentage of bits. And uh, in our experiment, uh, we uh, retrieved 3.41 percentage of bits. So when we reported this work in uh, in the archive, uh, we only reported combination of these two depolarizing channels. So uh, uh, it, uh, it got quick attention and uh, surprisingly, our friends from Griffith, Jared and Ia, uh, let us know another interesting scenario. So in this scenario, we are considering a combination of depolarizing channel and a unitary channel 
and we encode uh, this unitary channel for our for, without loss of generality we consider it, considered it to be Pauli Z and this target system is eigenvector of this uh, unitary channel. So in a definite order scenario, the depolarizing channel takes over and uh, we will not get any information out of it. However, when we connect this in an indefinite order, it is possible to have full one bit uh, information out of it. So it's a major, major boost in communication. So yeah, this is our experimental result. And uh, you can see like uh, the theoretical indefinite order is one bit throughout the strength of uh, depolariz depolarizing channels. And uh, experimentally, we managed to achieve 63 percentage of bits. So imagine the situation, uh, like uh, we, we are sending say 1000 bits and even with a with an imperfect experimental setup where uh, in the best case scenario of definite order, we won't be able to send any uh, information bit out of um, the, any information bit, any, any information out of the system. Even with our uh, experimental setup with all its imperfection, we will be able to send 630-ish bits uh, through the system. So uh, this is indeed a major boost in communication. So we reported this work in this uh, paper. And uh, imagine the possible applications of this particular uh, situation. For example, uh, let's, we can imagine that this combination could be used to send encrypted information. So uh, like an indefinite order combination will allow uh, the sender to receive, like send full one bit information to the receiver. Uh, however, uh, suppose someone tries to attack, uh, attack it in, term, in an intermediate stage and that will break the indefiniteness of these combinations and uh, he, that attacker will get nothing. Also, uh, we can imagine communication through atmospheric turbulence where there is a local laboratory channel, uh, U, and uh, when we manage to connect this channel in an indefinite order with the atmospheric turbulent channel, then uh, we will be able to send full information uh, to the receiver. So uh, this is my second work. And uh, uh, like after I finished this experiment, I was particularly interested in uh, uh, communication through indefinite causal order, like communication through like different exotic causal structures, what we can do more what we can say more about it. So uh, with that interest in mind, I started doing a theory project with uh, Fabio Costa. So in that project, we took a bit different approach uh, from the previous experiment. So in the previous experiment, uh, there is this uh, indefinite ordering between uh, two noisy channels. However, you can see the sender and receiver, the order between them is intact. So uh, in our situation, we consider a scenario where the sender and receiver, Alice and Bob, they are themselves in an indefinite order. So a uh, question might come, what is the particular reasoning behind this uh, motivation? So let us answer that with a game called guess your neighbor's input. So the rule of the game is there are two players, Alice and Bob, located somewhere in space time. Both of them receive some classical beat from the background uh, environment. And they process uh, those beats in their respective local laboratories and uh, uh, the gets sent some output to the environment. So the game will be successful when uh, both like each uh, each player successfully determines the input of their neighbor that is when a equal to x and b equal to y so the best strategy in a definite order scenario for example when alice is behind uh, the cause in alice is in causal past of bob is possible when say for example alice receives some classical beat x she sends it to bob Bob successfully retrieves it. However, uh, 
Alice cannot guess Bob's uh, input because Alice is in causal past of Bob and information cannot travel backward in time. So uh, the best strategy of uh, uh, best strategy of Alice will be to randomly guess this uh, B. So with that, the maximum probability of success will be always less than three over four, something known as causal inequality. So uh, okay, so like in a definite order scenario, one cannot uh, surpass this three over four value. However, it has been shown that uh, one can construct uh, a process shared between Alice and Bob, which is not, uh, uh, which cannot be represented in a definite ordered scenario. And such a process can uh, overcome this boundary of three over four and the maximum probability of success possible is this particular value, which is uh, like greater than three over four. And uh, thus the causal inequality is violated. So this uh, interesting causal structure was uh, first uh, reported in the paper by Oreshwar, Costa and Bruckner in 2012. And uh, so clearly uh, one can see like uh, this, uh, this particular task shows how indefinite causal order can be advantageous in some types of tasks. So, uh, one can clearly say this is a situation of uh, uh, like uh, when both parties are sending information to each other. So it's a communication task and uh, indefinite causal order is advantageous in this particular task. So it's a resource for communication. So, uh, that, so far so good. However, uh, this is uh, still a, a repre it's represented in terms of a game and um, it, it would be interesting to uh, talk about, uh, talk more of this kind of in, uh, exotic causal structures from an information theoretic perspective. So that is the aim of our theory work. So where uh, we try to formalize communication through uh, more, the most general process with, which doesn't admit indefinite order and say, for example, what would be the capacity of such process. So let's take small steps first and uh, let's talk about classical communication and let's talk about two parties. So uh, before uh, moving on to the classical communication, it, it is important to introduce some basic notations that I'll be, I'll be using in my slides in future. So let's start with uh, local operations. So there are three possible local operations. One is state preparation where the party receives some classical bit X and encodes it in the state uh, quantum state row X. Then it is possible to have uh, transformation through a quantum channel. So note that uh, there are two possible constraint in this uh, type of uh, operations. First of all, the quantum channel should produce a valid quantum state at the output. So uh, the positivity should be maintained and uh, the next one is this channel should be deterministic. Mathematically, the trace of the output is one. These two uh, constraints together are known as complete positive and trace preserving conditions, CPTP. The third situation is uh, state measurement where uh, uh, the party upon receiving some quantum state X measures the quantum state and receives the classical value y. So the conditional probability of getting the value y given the state rho x is given by the stress of uh, this uh, measurement operator sigma y and rho x. So this is known as Bond's rule. <clears throat> so the most general local operation can admit any combination of uh, these three operations. So this is a particular example. Uh, you can see the output of this output quantum system here is not, uh, I mean, the, uh, here this, uh, the overall operation A is not deterministic because it admits, like, because the output of quantum, output quantum state is conditioned over this measurement outcome. So the trace preserving condition is not uh, preserved. However, this channel, uh, this uh, local operation is still 
uh, uh, respect, uh, still respects complete uh, positivity. So it's a CP map. So uh, I have already introduced uh, local operations. So let's say Alice and Bob have uh, local operations. Uh, either they are using local operations A and B in their respective laboratory with uh, these systems AI, AO, and BIBO are like uh, input Hilbert spaces of Alice and BI is the input Hilbert spaces of Bob and AO and BO are the respective output Hilbert spaces. Now, to talk about the background causal structure, uh, it is necessary to uh, introduce the concept of process matrix. A process matrix is uh, formalis a process, like quantum process is a formalism that encodes the causal structure or lack of causal structure between Alice and Bob. So uh, it's a black box that uh, like if we delve further into it, it will reveal the uh, like uh, how they are these uh, local operations, these signals are oriented uh, between themselves. So uh, let me give a few uh, examples of such uh, process. So uh, here, uh, this uh, all the processes are represented with this gray color. So this is a typical example of belt, belt type experiment where uh, like Alice and Bob share some entangled state in their input system. They perform some operation and uh, the experiment is performed. So this is, uh, there is no communication in the previous um, this example. So in the next uh, example, there's communication from Alice and Bob where uh, like upon receiving some quantum state, Alice performs some operation on it and passes it through the uh, uh, quantum channel and Bob receives it and does some operation. So it's a one-way communication between Alice and Bob and there is no entanglement involved. And the more generalized process can be uh, this uh, entanglement assisted communication. So for example, we can talk about super dense coding where there is some, um, uh, Alice has a sh share of an entangled state uh, and uh, she passes it to Bob through this quantum channel. Okay, so in all this scenario, you can see these operations A and B admit definite order. By the way, uh, I'm using this inverted ground symbol, which is basically, uh, physically it means discarding the straight state. Mathematically, we, uh, it's, it's actually tracing out the output system, output quantum system. <clears throat> Okay, so all these examples are of definite order scenario. It is pos also possible to have some situation where the ordering between A and B are uh, randomly fluctuating. That is with probability P, Alice is before Bob, and with probability one minus P, the order is reversed. So any process that admits this type of convex uh, combination of consequent processes is called a, a causally separable process. Now we will talk about indefinite order process. So it turns out it is possible to uh, further generalize the process W such that it cannot be categorized in this form, in this uh, separable process form. And these are the process that shows true indefinite causal order between A and B. So, okay, we have given an introduction of local operations and process, and now we are ready to move on to uh, like uh, communication through process. So uh, like, uh, let's uh, consider what happens when we talk about uh, communication through a channel. In, a, in this sort of scenario, Alice receives some classical uh, bit X and she encodes it in row X. She sends it through the noisy channel N, Bob receive, receives, it, receives the state, performs some measurement and uh, gets the output Y. So, uh, uh, so the maximum amount of information, uh, I will talk more of this quantity, whole level quantity later. So the, uh, like uh, one, point, one way to quantify the information transmission is given by this whole level quantity of channel, where uh, the, which is represented by this, where this S is a von Neumann entropy. Uh, so like uh, here we have to maximize over all possible ensembles of uh, Alice's state to um, like maximize this quantity. 
and now uh, let's talk about uh, communication through process so in a communication through process Alice and Bob can uh, uh, apply some uh, quantum channel in their local operations. So uh, both A and B are quantum channels. So a co the combination of A, W, B can together form uh, an overall channel N uh, characterized by the local operations of Alice and Bob and uh, the background process. So they can use this channel to have to use uh, like to communicate through it and uh, the concept will be similar to the pre this scenario where uh, alice sends some state and uh, bob measures it and this helps us to define a holevo quantity of process so a holevo quantity of process is uh, given by holevo quantity of this channel uh, but we have to do an extra optimization uh, where like we have to optimize over uh, this Alice and Bob's local channel as well, channels as well. Okay, so we have given whole level quantity of a process. Now, um, to talk about uh, the capacity, which is the maximum amount of information possible to transmit over many users of channel per channel use. So it's a uh, a long uh, description, but it's basically a quantification of how much information possible to transmit through uh, a given settings of channel. So like, uh, and this is, uh, this definition of capacity is not unique because it depends on uh, different uh, asymptotic settings. So for example, one can have a naive strategy of product encoding and product decoding where um, Alice's uh, classical bit is encoded into uh, many users of, uh, like for many users of identical channel, uh, Alice can uh, encode her classical bit in a product state and Bob can also perform product measurement at the output. So uh, the capacity thus obtained is called one shot capacity and it is bounded by whole quantity. So this, uh, 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 this has been this inequality has been introduced by Holevo in 1973, and for process we can have similar situation of product encoding and product decoding. And this time we will uh, we can show that uh, the one shot capacity of a process also admits the similar uh, inequality. So we reported the, this inequality in this uh, paper. The next asymptotic state setting. Can, could be a uh, product encoding and entangled decoding where uh, Bob does a bit clever strategy. Uh, he performs a joint measurement at the output and it turns out uh, capacity in this case is uh, exactly given by whole level quantity of the channel. And uh, this inequality is uh, maintained where one shot capacity is the worst scenario and uh, the, the, the uh, better one is uh, product encoding and product uh, entangled decoding capacity. So this uh, work has been given by Holevo and Schumacher Westmoreland. And uh, we applied this strategy for process as well. And we showed that uh, the corresponding capacities of process admit a similar chain of inequalities. The next one, uh, the uh, interesting strategy would be like uh, Alice can perform a, an entangled uh, encoding and Bob can perform, Bob performs an entangled decoding. So it turns out uh, the capacity in this case, uh, like this is this capacity is given by regularized whole level quantity, which is whole level quantity if we consider this entire channel as one unit. Uh, so this is the definition of whole level quantity and it turns out this capacity in some cases can uh, uh, overcome the whole level, like one shot whole level quantity of this channel. So this work was uh, proved by Hastings. And uh, we used a similar concept for entangled encoding and entangled decoding. And uh, we showed that uh, whole level quantity of this, pro of this process W uh, like uh, could be less than in principle the entangled encoding and entangled decoding capacity. Okay, so we showed uh, different chains of inequality associated with uh, capacity of processes. 
there is one uh, caveat. Uh, here we are considering the many uses of uh, this channel A consisted of composed of A W B. However, it is possible to have a scenario where over many uses, uh, this uh, the optimum choice of channels may not be identical. So basically, we could have a scenario like this where uh, each is in each instance we have different uh, realizations of local operations and this will give uh, a combinations like that which is uh, not identically um, like, which are not identical uh, channels so this is specifically known as non stationary channels and uh, this makes the definition of our process a bit harder but uh, uh, so we overcome this uh, scenario by uh, uh, okay so like okay so first of all this uh, work was uh, for quantum case this uh, non stationary ch channels were introduced by hayashi and uh, in classical scenario it, it has been introduced by Fardu and han so uh, this uh, non stationary scenario is a bit difficult to use in our uh, definition of process uh, process capacities so we overcome it by uh, considering a, a particular theorem so i will introduce this theorem and then in the next slide i will say how we will overcome the uh, situations of non stationary channels so here you can see like uh, for a single process like that this a w b r like a b r quantum channels and this a and w together can form a monopartite channel. So it has been shown in this paper that any monopartite channel of this form can admit uh, this sort of decompositions where V1 and V2 are isomorphic. Uh, uh, so like V1 and V2 are, uh, what is it called? Okay, so like, uh, okay, so like, uh, uh, we can have this sort of decompositions where the output of V2 is uh, traced out. And uh, these are uh, uh, like both V1 and V2 are trace preserving channels. So uh, like uh, as the output of this V2 is traced out, it is uh, like possible to, like this makes V2 redundant and it is possible to imagine the whole system like this. And uh, one can see uh, the, this shaded region can be considered as a new quantum state. So something like that. So one can see this quantum state, in, the, in this quantum state, the entire information of the background process is concentrated. And this makes the Bob, this Bob's operation redundant. That is Bob's operation is not import, important. And uh, more interestingly, uh, the maximum, amount of information possible to transmit from Alice to Bob is bounded by logarithm of dimension of Bob's input system. So when like uh, dimension of bi is one, then uh, uh, then uh, this quantity will be one. That is, at, we can send at most one bit even through, a, through an indefinitely ordered system to Bob uh, when the Bob's input hit, uh, Hilbert space dimension is one. So uh, this is one interesting theorem in our paper. And also this, is, this particular simplific simplification helps us to overcome the non-stationary issue. So I will show how we did it. So like, suppose this is one instance of uh, the non-stationary scenario where this AI and BI are like specific uh, uh, channels indexed by I. So let's consider Alice's operation first. We can always extend this operation in such a way that uh, it is conditioned on this uh, input state uh, rho i, and we can have a fixed channel a bar in Alice's side. Now, in Bob's side, we already uh, saw that uh, Bob's output Hilbert system can be discarded, which means uh, we can always attach a fixed quantum state here, and uh, the index bi could be reflected in uh, reflected by a local operation in bob's side and we can we can only consider this operation 
uh, uh, which we represented by B bar. And now A bar W B bar constitute a new quantum channel uh, like this. And uh, this quantum channel over we can uh, like we can consider our asymptotic setting this quantum channel to be stationary and all we need to do is to like uh, optimize this uh, optimize over the states and uh, uh, this measurement so like fi and sigma y can be thought of as a overall measurement operator so this uh, uh, helps us to solve the non stationary issue and uh, with that, we summarize the different capacities of processes. So these are channel capacity, inequality, chain of inequalities for channel capacity, where product encoding, product decoding is the worst scenario. Then comes product encoding, entangled decoding, and then comes entangled encoding and entangled decoding. So this is, these are equivalent process capacities where Again, product encoding, product recording is the worst scenario, then product encoding, entangled decoding, and then uh, entangled encoding and entangled decoding. And all these capacities are limited by logarithm of dimension of Bob's input Hilbert space. So this is the chain of inequality we uh, found out for a one-way communication scenario. And the next, uh, next task, task we consider is uh, bidirectional communication where both Alice and Bob are trying to send information to each other. And uh, so we analyzed for uh, a causally separable scenario. So one way to quantify this bidirectional communication is to evaluate the mutual information between A and X and B and Y. And uh, it has been shown in this paper that when all the uh, dimensions of of the quantum systems are equal, that is D. This quantity will always be le less than or equal to logarithm of D for a causally separable process. So we approach the problem from uh, from perspective of uh, capacities of process. Specifically, we wanted to evaluate this quantity, one shot capacity from uh, in the direction of Alice to Bob and Bob to Alice. And uh, we figured out for, for a causally separable process, this bound is satisfied and uh, again this whatever quantity uh, like uh, this quantity would be bounded by the receiver's input uh, dimension of receiver's input quantum system that is uh, this quantity is respected and this is a more generalized bound possible for bidirectional communication note that when uh, this uh, dbi equal to dbi equal to dai then uh, like uh, uh, this whole inequality is reduced to log D, which which is the previously obtained inequality uh, in Milken's paper. So interesting observation is that uh, like uh, uh, in, an interesting question could be whether this inequality uh, could be violated when we, we when we use uh, an indefinite ordered scenario, and uh, so far we couldn't find any violation for this uh, scenario. And we reported this in this work, and uh, we generalized this scenario for in multi parties as well. So, like this is a more realistic example where we can consider distributed systems or like internet. And uh, so, this is a specific, specific causal structure between the communicating parties. Alice two is the is causally passed before Alice three, Alice three, and Alice one, and uh, Okay, this is a particular example of network, but uh, a more generalized scenario could be like there, these uh, connections are randomly, the, the causal orders are randomly changing. Uh, uh, so we can admit for an in party scenario, the back, we can admit a more generalized background causal structure. And we analyze this scenario for causally separable process where this entire W is, uh, realization of each permutation of the communicating parties with some probability. And this is a scenario of broadcast communication where all the party are trying to send information to all other parties. So we've, uh, we've showed that uh, the maximum amount of information possible to transmit in that scenario is bounded by uh, 
uh, like when all in dimensions are equal, that is D. Then maximum amount of information possible to transmit is bounded by total number of available links uh, <coughs> times logarithm of D. And uh, just like the previous scenario of bipartite uh, communication, uh, bidirectional communication, no violation is known for this scenario as well. So with that, I end my talk. Uh, there, these are take home messages. Uh, so in the first uh, part of my talk, I showed how uh, we realized an indefinite causal order scenario experimentally. And with, uh, this indefinite causal order scenario is also called a quantum switch. In the second part of my talk, I showed how uh, we can use quantum switch to achieve certain communication advantages and we experimentally demonstrated it. And in the third part of my talk, I considered uh, uh, a more general, general causal structure, which is not necessarily quantum switch. And uh, we, uh, uh, like, uh, we analyzed a more general causal structure from an information theoretic point of view. We defined different types of classical capacities for one-way communication. We showed that uh, when the dimension of uh, Bob's, I mean, the receiver's input Hilbert space is limited by two, then at most one uh, bit, uh, one bit is uh, like, uh, like at, the most, at most one bit is possible to transmit even for an indefinite ordered scenario. So the bidirectional uh, and uh, like uh, bidirectional communication and multi-party communication has been introduced for only causally separable process. And we found a new bound for uh, uh, the total information transmission. And, uh, and interestingly, we haven't been able to violate the bound that those bounds for a causally indefinite order scenario. So with that, I end my talk with an open conjecture that this bound is a universal bound. Thank you. I'm uh, clapping on behalf of the audience. Thank right. you very much. <laughs> Thank it's you. A very interesting talk. Um, do we have any questions? <clears throat> any questions? Um, okay. So uh, I actually have, have two questions. So the first one is. Uh, in your first part, the, this indefinite causal orders, it, it seems that you are sending uh, information from the first sender back to the second sender, right? So it's kind of like, does it violate the no signal, signaling principles? No, or so is it anything uh, related to uh, signal, signaling from the first party to the sec second party? Are, are you familiar with the no signal, signaling principles? So can you talk about no signaling condition? Like, yes, yes. Yeah. Bring so up the slide, Kamudi, the experiment slide. Just a minute, I lost, yeah, okay. Oh, so, uh, I think it's very begin in the very beginning when you introduce your content switch. Yeah. Let me. <laughs> That's a back. long way down. <laughs> okay, so like, um, are you talking about? Uh, I think like first, first few slides. You yeah, these log diagrams. No, no, I think the quantum switch experiment itself, like the okay. schematic. Yes. Yeah. Where you have the A. A, B, C boxes. Okay. Is that what it is? Minji? Yeah. Can you see the slide like that I'm showing now? Not. No, yet. I see summary of different capacities. Okay. Uh, let me. So, what do you see now? Like. Uh, yes. Could you, I think you could you go back to uh, probably earlier one? Yeah, this one. This one. Yeah. Okay. So it seems that you. Uh, the A has sending information back to the input of B and yeah. B is sending kind of information back to the input of A, right? So uh, uh, 
what is what is the relationship between this uh, indefinite causal uh, causal order with the non signaling or they are completely different issues so uh, i'm not familiar with uh, the non signaling principle that you are mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. so like maybe we can discuss more of it so basically okay. here what what it is happening it's like uh, we are talking about the superposition of two different space times so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in one scenario in one space time like uh, the information is going from alice to bob and in the other space time information is going from bob to alice and it's mm -hmm. like superposition of this space time so it's not like a, a like simultaneous uh, like uh, in a, like it's not like in one particular space time alice is both sending information and receiving information it's like coherent superposition of two space time if that answers the question okay uh, yeah, so maybe we can uh, uh, join in uh, um, so non-signaling uh, refers to non-signaling for space-wide separations or uh, non-signaling uh, across two sides of a bipartite state but that's yes, not what's yes. going on here yes so yes. here a and b are time-like separated even uh, uh, in a in a single space time if you have a acting before b uh, then there is no reason to impose no signaling so that Precisely, the idea here is to consider signaling scenarios where things are not space-like separated. Ah, okay. okay. So uh, you... the novel thing is uh, that uh, you cannot even uh, say so. They are events are time-like separated, but you cannot really say which one is before we, the other. Ah, okay, mm. okay, okay. So I think I'm confused because you kind of like put M. So normally I would consider time goes from left to right. So uh, yes. you put A and B ah, okay. on the same space. It's seems to me that they are occurring at the same uh, so time. So oh, okay, I get okay. it should be like vertical. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Got it. Uh, my second question is, is this uh, process W in your, your last, last uh, talk? Uh, let me bring that slide. Yes. <laughs> so I think over there you are considering uh, a process W so that you could um, somehow uh, encompass this A and B. Uh, um, trying to understand. So, mm -hmm. so, you, um, so instead of, so the result here is that you can identify the uh, whole level capacity of W, right? This yeah. is instead of A and B. And yeah. A and B are, uh, are given as a fixed, fixed process and you're trying to yeah. see what w you can maximize the output of the of the channel yeah okay okay then i i see so like uh this is the channel con composed mm -hmm, of mm -hmm, a mm -hmm. w and we are maximizing mm -hmm. over a and b here okay so it's a composition of kind of two you have two fixed channel and you have a, a, a process that you can optimize. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay then. I see. Okay. Um, any further questions? Okay, uh, if not, uh, I would thank you again. Thank you very much. A very much. nice talk, a very uh, nice result as a PhD student. Good job. Thank you. <laughs>